Good morning. Thanks for that uh, introduction. Very, very nice. Thank you. Um, I'm affiliated with, with uh, some, some pretty good connections with Elizabethtown College. Um, I have a, a older sister that graduated here back in the early 1980s. Um, and more recently, probably over the last 20 years or so, um, my, my company has been uh, involved with the Family Business Center here at Elizabethtown College, which has been uh, really, really instrumental and helpful in our company, uh, in our family business, uh, to set up various uh, corporate governance and, and family governance as we've grown up, particularly in the early years uh, at the college here. A um, couple, couple of uh, questions for the, mostly students here, which is great. Um, I understand there's some family business uh, major program, is that true? Uh, is anybody in that program here? Show of hands, of course. How about, how about business students overall? Various majors, okay, okay. How about outside of business major, arts and sciences or psychology or anybody in that realm? Okay, okay, they're still sleeping I think. <laughs> How about, how about anybody that showed up because you heard a candy guy was coming and you figured there'd be free samples? Anybody in that, in that boat? Okay. Okay. okay good. We have some of that, so if nobody falls asleep, everybody's going to get some on the way out today, which is great. Okay. Okay, a few more things about myself. Uh, I do have three children. Um, which you see up on the screen there from a nice ski trip we took last year out to, uh, to the Rocky Mountains in, in Utah. You see from the collage of pictures, I'm also a diehard Philadelphia Eagles fan, so all those school, school years in Philadelphia must have rubbed off on me somehow. Um, we have a very energetic uh, one-year-old puppy at home, which keeps us busy too. Um, and the wonderful woman in the picture there is my longtime girlfriend, Elena, who is a entrepreneur in her own right and a chocolatier in uh, uh, Lemoyne, Pennsylvania in West Shore Harrisburg. So if you're in that area and you want to pick up some high-end chocolates, uh, stop by and visit us at, at Macris Chocolates. Oops. But I'm here primarily to talk about uh, Warrell today. I'm going to talk about a little bit about our story. I'm going to talk about um, uh, a 50-year story of endurance on how we manage uh, our company and our unique kind of business model in the candy industry, candy and snack industry, um, and also uh, a, pretty, a pretty large family that, that we do a, a decent job in managing. Um, our company last year celebrated its 50th anniversary, um, and we produced a video commemorating our, um, our success that tells the story maybe a little bit better than I can and, and certainly hopefully keeps you keeps you awake, so I'd like to play that for you. Do the uh, sound issue? Yeah, that's on. Working. Hmm. Nothing there? Let's go here and see. That's okay. That's okay. <coughs> okay, I'll, I'll, so we'll, we can walk through. We'll walk through the video. I'll, I'll, I'll navigate. It's not quite as great a story as me telling it, <laughs> but I can, I can I can walk through it. <coughs> um, this is my this is my father here, that uh, is going to come on and tell us the story about 1965 starting uh, Pennsylvania Dutch Candies, um, and really as a story of entrepreneurism, of starting a company. Um, no, really as a leap of faith. Um, it, uh, a three-way partnership with his brother and his father um, from a small distributorship in, in Pennsylvania selling Pennsylvania Dutch candies. The business was outside of Carlisle, selling to markets that 
the big guys didn't sell to, the Hershey and Mars didn't sell to. We sold to niche markets, gift shops, and tourist attractions. Um, as it, the companies pro progressed, this is my uh, brother-in-law, Kevin Silva, who's the uh, new president of the company um, from about the past year. And here we're walking through a lot of our current uh, business model, which talks around the, the, the issues of contract manufacturing. So that's really the major business that we're within today. Um, this video highlights a lot of our, our uh, management. This is an outside family manager that ran our business for 10 years, which was great from a mentorship standpoint. We'll talk about that theme a little bit later. Um, and of course, you can't do it all without your people. So a lot of, a lot of a thought process about thanking our, our people here. Um, I'm talking about primarily about innovation because that's really a differentiation point of our company as we, as we innovate new products for our various customers in our, in our business model. I don't know what he's talking about now. <laughs> I think he's thanking everyone. We're talking about camaraderie in the industry. It's a very tight-knit um, tight uh, industry. It's a niche. The, the confectionery company is, of course, dominated by the M&M &M Mars and, and uh, Hershey's uh, prime at the top, but there's an awful lot of mid-range players um, that also compete in the marketplace and a lot of uh, niche-type products and items. Candy sells in any avenue of life. Anywhere you put a, a display of candy, if there's traffic in a retail location, it's going to sell. If we put it at the desk by security downstairs, you know, you're going to sell through that, that product. So there's a lot of opportunity in, in, in our company, in our industry, I should say. I wish I remember what I said. Um, at the end of the day, we talked about you know the, the dedication of our folks, and, and we have. You want to start again? You guys want to hear it again? Want to start again? All right, let's do it. <laughs> attractions and roadside stands and the like, and it worked out uh, very well. I came to RL 25 years ago uh, as an opportunity uh, to get into a family business. We've now grown into a pretty large contract manufacturing company that uh, uh, serves very large companies and small companies as well. Uh, throughout the years, though, I think the strength of our employees and what they've added and, and contributed to our business have really helped us to grow. The world business of all the businesses that I've been in is operated and attempts to operate more as a organization rather than a family that helps strengthen the business. Candy is exciting in and of itself. When you give or receive candy, there's always pleasure in the room. I think the most fun is that there's camaraderie among the other manufacturers. So even though we compete, we also work together to deliver candy, which is a really fun product for consumers. Even though it's a small part of their life, it's a happy part. We compete on the street with our competitors, but when a product guy has a problem in the plant, we all chip in to help him succeed in his plan. The future of the company is really in the innovation side of our business. We've made really big investments in that area, whether it's a Fortune 500 consumer product company or a major retailer, they all turn to URL to want to know what's new, what's innovative, what can we bring and deliver to our consumers a better uh, experience because the consumers are demanding new products on a shelf uh, all the time. It's my aspiration and, and intention as leader to continue to build upon uh, the rich heritage of our, of our founder, Lynn Morrell, uh, and ensuring that we incorporate the ethics, integrity, uh, the values of the business uh, that help to deliver value to our customers. 
we wouldn't have success without our employees, our both family, non-family leadership, our vendors, but mostly our customers. We've had many people that have given over 30, 40, and even a 50 year employee last year. So those employees have really dedicated their lives to our business and to help us grow. I'm extremely proud of the business that Link built, of the freedom that he's given me to help his business succeed. But no business succeeds without all the people in the plant. We have an enormous number of people who dedicate, not eight hours a day, they dedicate their lives to what it is they do and they work when they have to work. And you can't help but thank those people every day. All right, what do you think? Okay, so that's a little bit about our, our history. Um, but the story of a family business really starts with a family because that's, that's a lot of what it's about. So this is my family. Um, I'm over to the left there. Um, the, my parents are in the center. My mother's here today. Wave, Mom. Um, I'm one of seven children, so the rest of the folks there are my siblings. I have five sisters and one brother. Um, so together we represent the 100% uh, of the URL uh, ownership uh, of our company. Uh, not in that picture, but you saw from the video, that's my brother-in-law, Kevin Silva. He's the president of our company, so I report to him. Um, he's married to my, my sister, and I've been with the company 25 years, but uh, has a uh, first new leadership position in terms of leading the company. We had a non-family manager that led us for about 10 years, um, and now we've, we've come back as a, really a mentorship relationship and now we've taken on the, the strides of, of leading the company uh, with family management again. Um, for my, my siblings, just to give you kind of a sense, uh, a lot of times you think about family business, you think about everyone living in one small town. That's not the case with our family. Um, we have three, three branches of the seven that live in the uh, Harrisburg area that work involved in day-to-day -day operations of the business. But the balance of us live all over the country, from uh, the West to the Caribbean. Uh, following their passions and what they're, they're interested in. That's a, that's a big theme I'll, I'll get back to because uh, it's something we very much believe in as a value of our, of our company and our, and our heritage. I'll spend a little time on this slide. Um, this talks a little bit about the history of our company, kind of the dovetail from the video, and kind of talks to some specifics about our company and our growth, and it really feeds into what our, our, our story is. Uh, 1965, I acquired uh, Pennsylvania Dutch candies. Uh, my father did. Uh, about a million dollars, primarily distributor type of company, um, and grew to uh, 1974 really is the next milestone where we, we bought a company called Catherine Beecher Candies, which was over in Manchester outside of York. And uh, they made two products really, butter mints and butter toasted peanuts, uh, one, one of the two which we still make today. Um, 1982 uh, was a <coughs> Another substantial acquisition, probably maybe, maybe the, certainly the biggest at the time, that was a company out in Wisconsin called Melster Candies, which was a regional uh, confection company. General Line made a lot of different products. Um, it took about a substantial uh, manufacturing operation, about 100,000 square feet there. It took about 10 years till we figured out that we couldn't sell all those products. We needed to really pare down the product offering and get to niche products that we really could. So by the end, we had some really uh, uh, high competency in some specific products. Uh, anybody familiar with item called Circus Peanuts? The little orange marshmallow things, you probably, you would know them if you saw them. Um, this company was the number one manufacturer in the country of that product. About, about 30,000 pounds a day was made of, of that product. Um, they also made some uh, whipped marshmallow that were shaped like Santa Clauses and, and Easter bunnies and we, and we sold uh, as inexpensive chocolates for the seasonal trade to, to Walmart, Kmart, and in those years the dollar trade was just kind of emerging uh, as a growth in that area. Um, in the meantime, Catherine Beecher Candies, where we were making the butter mints and butter toasted peanuts, had started been getting some, some, some traction with uh, other, some, some uh, CPG type companies, consumer product good companies, um, and the growth was, was well outpaced 
where we could sell uh, in our small 30,000 square foot facility. So in year 2000, we acquired a 200,000 square foot plant in Camp Hill, uh, which is our current main manufacturing facility. Um, that marked a really, it's kind of a left of that line, right of that line in terms of uh, where our company is and its structure. Um, before we had that acquisition, we never had uh, any debt at all in the history of our company. Um, but, but to acquire buildings, put in new processing lines, that takes a tremendous amount of capital. And we were committed also to being, uh, remaining a family business, so we didn't want outside partners. So that required you know, bank borrowing. So it's, a, it's a kind of a diff different uh, environment of the company since then. In 2004, we ended up selling the Melster Candies. It was a, a profitable entity, but we sold it uh, primarily for a couple of reasons. We had uh, uh, succession planning issues. It wasn't really a known successor that was going to take over that company in a small town. The growth had slowed and was flatlined. We had a high concentration of business at Walmart, um, which sounds kind of funny because everyone has a high concentration of business at Walmart today. Um, but for us, it was a little bit of, of a high risk piece. Um, and we had good multiples to sell it. And we needed the money to reinvest in our facility uh, back here in Pennsylvania. So uh, that transaction was done. And you see some of the growth that took off in the, in the 10 years following that. Um, in 2009, we bought a, another small plant over in the city of York, uh, called, formerly called Classic Caramel, which makes primarily industrial type of caramel. So if you think of big 55-gallon drums of caramel, we sell it to other candy manufacturers, baking industry, ice cream industry, that kind of product mix. Um, and in the last year, two years, we've really been involved in a lot of transition in our company, um, going from a, a non-family uh, leadership to a family leadership, and there's a bunch of new people on our team. So we're working heavily on that. Uh, and in the last couple of years, we have transitioned all the ownership to the second generation. So that's kind of where the, the, the milestones and the, the, the company has, has gone. So you, if you roll that all up to today, um, we have about 230 full-time year-round employees. Um, I just saw a stat just yesterday that we had 350, if you include temporary workers, that we had in our peak that just, uh, just is concluding now. Uh, we produce about 20 million pounds of candy between the two plants a year um, and two, with 250,000 square feet of space. And as I mentioned, from a family structure standpoint, three of the seven are involved um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, four are, are inactive. Just to kind of break down our, our different divisions that we have and we, and we offer, um, our, main, our main business is our contract manufacturing piece of business. It's about 80% of our total uh, volume today. Um, this is where we sell major consumer product good companies. I'll show you some of the brands in the next slide. Um, this is where we sell products. They market under their own brands nationally and sell to all major retailers um, across the country. In our, our second division, we still have some niche and legacy brands that we market ourselves as a smaller piece of our business. I mentioned Catherine Beecher Candies. That was a, a real person um, as, a, as a kind of a legacy brand. She had a fantastic buttermint formula, and it's still fantastic. Uh, so we sell some of that uh, across the country. Anybody heard of a brand called Bonama Turkish Taffy? Anybody? Maybe from their parents, or if you're from New York, maybe? OK. Uh, Bonama, we've been selling since year 2010. Um, it was a national brand at one time. They had national TV advertising, and it, Bonomo is a hard piece of taffy. Um, and you took a, a candy bar size, smacked it on the table, it broke into pieces, and you ate the little pieces in your mouth. So it was like the world's first interactive candy. Um, it was off the market for 25, yeah, it sounds kind of funny compared to Pop Rocks, right, and everything else, they just see LED lights on the, on the novelty candy. But that's what it was. Um, in, it's, it was off the market between 1985 and 2010. A gentleman in Long Island bought the brand um, and was very passionate about the product, looking for a manufacturer. So we got involved in the manufacturing process. And then it turned out he didn't really have a sales plan, so we helped out on that side too. So we're the sales and, and marketing agents for that brand as well. It's about, it, it, when, when it came out, the, the National Confectioners Association had, ran a survey every year and said, hey, what candy is not available uh, commercially available. And the number one, number one item that, that buyers wanted to buy that wasn't available, that they had requests for, was Bonomo Turkish Taffy. So that's kind of a, a, a neat niche story. Um, 
it's about a million dollars of business, so it's not a, a gigantic piece of, of, of national business for a national brand, but it's, it plays very well within the scope of our company's capabilities. Finally, we have a, uh, a brand called Pennsylvania Dutch Candies, which was the original company. Uh, it still operates kind of a lot, lot of the ways as it did originally. It sells to non-traditional candy places. You see the brand, is anybody familiar with this brand? Have you seen that around? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more, um, uh, you see it a lot in tourist attractions. It's, it's what are probably we're known most for as Warrell, um, is our Pennsylvania Dutch Candies uh, brand. Airport shops, tourist attractions, farm markets, that kind of uh, clientele. Won't spend much time on this slide, uh, but this is our, our uh, core competency of our capabilities in manufacturing. We do a lot of chocolate enrobing, which you saw some in the video. That was all the chocolate pretzels coming down the belt. Uh, chocolate panning is uh, where we, we rotate uh, uh, chocolate in a belt and uh, set up chocolate on top and, and polish, like the samples over here. Um, we have substantial capabilities there. We have uh, hot panning, which is melting sugar in a copper kettle uh, to get a uh, kind of a natural product between sugar and, and, and uh, nut meat. We have substantial capabilities on brittles and nut clusters. Um, if you're familiar with a brand called True North, um, it's a, it's a um, cluster of nuts with a little bit of syrup as a binder. And it's, it gives you, again, a, a natural uh, a profile. Um, also make peanut brittle and, and more confectionery nut brittles of, of things like that. The caramel I spoke about, we have sub substantial capability at our York facility to make caramel. And the taffy is really a niche kitchen, um, also at the York plant. Some of, our, some of our customers here between our different divisions, um, you get a sense, you get a sense kind of, 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 of what we do. Um, <coughs> produce a lot of chocolate uh, pretzels. True North is a nut cluster products. Sun Maids is raisin, so we do some coating there. Do a lot of business with Frito-Lay these days. Um, and I'll get into some of the challenges in a, in a, in a little bit. Okay. On, a, on the right side from kind of our branded um, side, so we market to all these guys as well. We have a, we have a very small team that does this, but um, these brands we, we sell offer both our, really our manufacturing services to the Walmart uh, club channels where you got Costco, Sam's, uh, that kind of uh, realm. They can take the, the volume that's needed to really produce custom products in our large facility. So that's a, a key part of our business model. And then finally, I mentioned Pennsylvania Ash Candy is really in, in a niche uh, customer base, right? So this is, we have about 4,000 independent accounts across the country. Here's a few locally. Interesting, about 90% of our business of Pennsylvania Dutch candies is outside of the state of <coughs> Pennsylvania. So, so um, it really does have national uh, sense. So being, being in Lancaster County, we'd probably take it for granted, but there really is an affinity for uh, the, the Amish heritage, uh, et cetera. Just to give you a sense of kind of how we're organized at our company, I think it's interesting from both the family business perspective and then just a sense of how as a, you know, I call it a medium-sized business, uh, how we're organized. Um, we have our shareholders, which I went through, which was the family. We have uh, a body, which was actually the idea came from the Family Business Center here in Elizabethtown about uh, generating a family council for governance, so we do that. What does the family council do? We talk about issues. We sit together two, three times a year, the seven of us. Um, talk about, sometimes they're family issues, but usually they're about really high 40,000 foot issues about uh, what the direction of the business is going to be. Um, um, are we going to recruit third generation members to come into our business? How are we going to do that? What are the rules of engagement that should do that? Uh, do we want to keep the business long term? Do people want to cash out? Um, all those things. So that, that information funnels down to our board of directors. Even though the family council is really a non-binding uh, structure, it really does have uh, quite a bit of weight. It, it, it boils down to our board of directors, which is also a mix of family and outsiders, uh, which we have worked hard to um, diversify and develop and get input from outside of the region, outside of the area, and try to get expertise to really be a world-class manufacturing company. Um, then we fall down to our execution uh, team, uh, president, CEO, and we have four vice president levels. And just cover from my standpoint, it was in the bio, but I cover all the sales sides from the three wings. We have uh, small teams that do that. Um, a big piece of our business is R&D and innovation. I can't talk about that enough. Um, 
are generally our company, people come to us for new products. They come to us for new things, the things that, that they don't want to commercialize in their own factories. So they come to a company like Warrell and say, hey, can you make this for me? And interestingly enough, there's been more partnership over the last 10 years than previously where they want to know our ideas. They don't want to come to us and say, okay, well, we got to put in a huge piece of equipment, expensive equipment to do that. They want to come in and say, hey, what equipment do you have? What, what flavor profiles can we make? Um, what trending is ha out there? Um, so we're going to talk about that in a minute, more about um, good for you type of uh, mentality, et cetera. I have a small marketing team. My, my sister Annette runs the marketing team, uh, which supports all three of our, our, our sales divisions. We have a customer service department, and we differentiate client support to manage the tremendous amount of details that go on in commercializing new items for major contra contract manufacturing customers. Okay. So then I just want to walk through some challenges that come to mind, which I'll share with you, um, from both our company perspective and also the industry. So you can kind of sense of the, 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 the food business. And this one is, is really interesting, I think. Um, I'd be <laughs> maybe interested to hear over you know, lunch or other times how you guys uh, feel about this. Because from, from a, a, a manufacturing perspective, there's really not a whole lot of excitement from next generation to work in manufacturing companies. Doesn't seem very fun, doesn't seem um, very sexy. We've had a lot of um, feedback around that, around those lines. Um, so it, it remains a challenge for, for, for our industry. And um, I, I give a little bit of a pitch to, to next generations to consider uh, roles in manufacturing because there's a tremendous amount of pros of the economy. Um, there's, there's tremendous satisfaction of making something and selling something that's tangible that you can export, sell, and grow business. If you talk to economists, they tell you that, that manufacturing companies add more economic growth and value than do horse trading service type industries. Um, and it was interesting, love them or hate them, Donald Trump just spent his whole campaign, an awful lot of it, talking about, what are you talking about? Talking about manufacturing. And that resonated with a lot of places that he ended up winning the election on. So. Um, It'd be it's going to be interesting to see if there's a, a shift in some of uh, this area. Um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. It remains a challenge. It remains a challenge for really every manufacturing company that that I know. Our specific situation in contract manufacturing is also a challenging business model. It's challenging primarily because every year we reinvent the wheel on terms of what products sell. We have a tremendous amount of people that buy uh, first, time, first time trial product in our, our factory. If it doesn't sell on the retail shelf, you don't get to make it again. The way to be, to be efficient in a manufacturing company is to make the same product every day. And it's hard to do that when you are constantly changing. So it's one of the challenges of our business model. Um, you build a little bit more uh, margin in to do that. Um, and uh, that's really part of the development strategy of a lot of the big uh, CPG companies. Of course, the great benefit of being a contract manufacturer is you don't have all the <laughs> sales and marketing costs that big companies do, and you don't have the, the brand present. We really don't have any substantial national brands in our company. Um, so this is really our avenue to really compete on national scale. I can go into almost every store, every grocery store, every discounter, every convenience store in America, and I see products on the shelf that are made in our facility, which is pretty exciting. The other thing I would say about, about the, the model is that we do, we, we're involved, as you saw from a lot of the divisions, a lot of different markets. That is, that is a complex, complexity that is challenging for us. So we've, we've, we've worked with our board, we've worked with uh, some strategic planning partners try, in, our, in our new uh, executive team, really trying to figure out how we can streamline, just like my story about Melster Candies that we did uh, uh, 20 years ago. How can we streamline our products to, to be really good specialists in areas that have long run niche and, and, and do well? That's the factory I talked about. That's the 200,000 square foot plant uh, that we bought in year 2000. Um, maybe it's kind of obvious, but, but manufacturing is very capital intensive. It's a lot of years that that part of the key to success, you invest more than you make. That's just part of the game of the, of the business. You have to, otherwise you get, you get run by. You have to keep upkeep your equipment, 
um, for the useful life. You have to up upkeep uh, facilities. Um, you have to stay with regulations. All those things uh, are very, can be very costly. Um, in a, in a, in a ma manufacturing a product that is relatively low cost. <coughs> you have to make a lot of it to, uh, to make up the, the margins for the investment. I think the candy industry would acknowledge that there's also shifts of trends and we're engaged with them and it's really interesting the the data that you see and the trends that you see and sometimes the data syncs with the trends and sometimes it does sometimes there's not there's not a parallel path to how those those things work um, there's no question that consumers are more conscious of what they want to eat and maybe more so than they ever have been before um, how does that dovetail with what uh, Warrell can offer? Can we offer, this is where our R&D and innovation comes in, can we offer lower sugar options? Can we offer um, what's the current trends and optics, if you will, on higher protein things like nuts that we do a lot of nut processing, things along those lines. Um, the, issue, the whole issue of um, uh, non, uh, partially hydrogenated oils that's been now strict from, from really all food processors. The whole idea of processed food to begin with has even been called in question at, at, at times. Um, then there's the issue of non-GMO. And what does that mean? Uh, what does it mean for a company our size um, to, to change over and, and comply with regulations like that? And is the science really sound on non-GMO? There's a lot of evidence that says it's not. Um, non-GMO is what, G, uh, science is what feeds the world. And that's the attitude of a lot of, 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 of the food processing industry. Um, the other thing I would say is that the industry fights very hard on, on optics of, we call them sugar Nazis, which run around and um, say that everything has sugar is bad for you. And the, the, the industry's fought very hard, and we've, we've bought into that, that there's a balanced lifestyle of everything, and everything in moderation. Um, so in our, in our national meetings and organizations, we talk, talk a lot about that. And really, uh, Mars and Hershey's really have led the way very well in that kind of uh, uh, environment. Interesting thing, and this is relatively new, and it's been kind of under the radar. Is anybody, anybody here from Hershey's? I don't think there is, but is anybody here from Hershey's? I'm not picking on them, but um, this is a picture of Hershey's plant in Mexico. And if you look on the current set, in the, in, the, in the Christmas candy sets that are out in the stores now, you'll see, if you turn over a lot of Hershey's products, you'll see a lot of the products that are made in this, in this facility that were previously made in USA. So it's an interesting um, thought process where you have consumers that are very, very interested in, me, in, in what goes in the, into the product, but there's some lessening of the, of the stigma of eating product made in third world countries. Now these are world class plants. I, I'm sure they're safe. They are safe. Um, but you wouldn't have had this 10 years ago. There'd be a real stigma for that. Since you know, your generation, we've been bought every consumer soft good, hard good you've bought has been from the Far East, likely. <coughs> but your food has generally been made here. And that's, if, if there's changing there, um, that's a potential threat to our company because we don't have an overseas operation. It's also an opportunity. But um, it's interesting to see how that plays out. There's also a parallel of this with the election. What's going to happen to the plants that are already built if there's uh, new uh, trade, trade uh, tariffs or laws or things? So it's, again, something to really, really look at over the next couple of years. Um, tremendous amount of government regulation. I used to think that was really kind of bull and that was what it is. But in the last 10 years, it's been tremendously more. Um, again, the government has really pushed uh, various regulations for safe food. Separation of allergens has cost our company somewhere between a half a million and a million dollars of, of compliance costs a year um, because when we run peanuts and then we run tree nuts, we change over. Any given time, Mike Mitchell's been to our plant a few times, every time you walk through, there's people cleaning lines because we're changing over between allergens of one to another. Um, 
it's a change. It's different. It's a challenge. Um, all kinds of indecision by the government and the FDA about what should be on labeling as consumers are interested. There's, there's all sorts of sort out on that. That may or may not be in you guys' uh, lexicon as you, you look at things, but there's a lot of volunteer programs about front of the pack labeling on calorie content, fat, all these things has, been, has led to a tremendous amount of confusion at both the consumer level and it's also a tremendous amount of cost at the process level and all that does is increase the cost uh, of our food supply and, and, and change. Uh, and finally, I'd add one that's really specific to our industry, and that's about the sugar lobby. Um, can't confirm my audience not talk about sugar. Um, Americans pay about double the, the world rate of sugar because of, the amount, because of a depression era program that was set up um, to subsidize American sugar growers during the Great Depression. That along with all the other commodities was also had subsidized programs. They've all been repealed except for sugar, which the, uh, our industry and others have been fighting for really for, for multi-generations now. Um, again, be interesting to see if that changes. This generally renegotiated every five years during the farm bill. Okay. All right, so we got all that. Then we're back to the family again. We got to deal, we have that to work on. Um, we're in second generation now. There are 17 members of the third generation. Between me and my six siblings, there are 17 in the third generation. And so it's, 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 it's continuous debate. Um, uh, are, there, are there folks interested in coming in? What are the, challenge, what are the challenges to be like that? Uh, well, can all family branches stay in for that long? Um, do we need to have new partners? All those things uh, are be hitting us over the, next, over the next 10 years or so as we figure out this piece. But it adds another layer of, of complexity, a little bit, in being, a, being part of a family business. Okay, got a few minutes, a few minutes before we got to take some questions. I wanna just give a little bit of, uh, a little bit of advice. That's here. Maybe dovetailing on some things that I, that I said. Um, we talked about the map of all the shareholders being all over the country. Mom and dad didn't say you had to be a part of the family business. They got to explore their passion. So that's what I would encourage all of you um, to do. Find something you're passionate about, explore it, work in that. You're going to be best at that. Develop sales skills. Do, we have, is, do you guys have a sales class as part of the business program at Elizabethtown College? Is there a sales class? No? Work on skills, work on, work on developing the sales skills, because that is extraordinarily important in any walk of life that you're in. Um, the, the power of persuasion um, is, is, is very much needed. I'll tell you a quick story. A great friend of mine from, from high school became an attorney because he wanted to become an attorney. Worked in, worked in New York City, one of the most cutthroat, cutthroat industries he found out that there is. <laughs> Fighting people in his own office. Guess what? He became an expert salesperson about 90% of his time is not spent doing uh, legal work, it's doing sales work, entertaining clients and, and recruiting clients. Uh, you'll find that more so than not in most walks of life. Um, so even if you're not a, you don't have to be a type A personality or an outgoing personality even, but just to develop those, those skills is extraordinarily important for success. Uh, for those of you that may be in family businesses, um, <coughs> Expect to come in and work harder than everyone else because expectations are always a lot, a lot higher. It always helps to have uh, as much experience too um, to, to achieve that. Um, and that's, it's, 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 uh, it's a tremendous opportunity uh, for development, for growth, for, for wealth generation, and it's also uh, uh, can be very challenging and you gotta have the right mindset for it. When you have a job, don't relax in your job. Because um, people will pass you by. Always think about what you can do to innovate, make it better, make suggestions. Um, that's really important. Um, networking, really important. Um, utilizing friends, family, but then with, within your companies, um, the power of a mentor, the power of a, of a sponsor is very powerful. Somebody that takes interest in you and you and you and them. Um, 
attending as many outside functions as you can as your companies would allow is really important. It gets it gets grows your experience and your 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 frame of reference. It's it's, it's great. Um, company culture I think is is missed a lot. Uh, when you do post, when folks leave our company for whatever reason, and you do kind of the, the post mortem interviews of why they're leaving and what are the opportunities they have, as a smaller company, we hate people leave because we don't have huge staffs. We have, you know, our, 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 we depend on our folks a lot. So it's always a big, always a big hit when somebody leaves our company because it fills that spot we don't have a lot of backup on. Um, but one of the big things I've kind of found over my time is that the company culture really depends on happiness of the job, and a lot of times it boils down to uh, folks. It wasn't, it wasn't in sync with what their personal beliefs were. So before you take a job, I'd strongly suggest you do your research. Talk to others in the, in the organization. Find, find through social media or other places. Other people that work there and reach out to them. Find out how the company is to work for. Um, if, you, if you do that, you're going to be a lot happier. Um, and that would really help. But if that's not the... If that's the right, not the right company for you, then then you know, find something else. Um, then finally, you know, learning that kind of goes with networking. But but learning, people learn in different ways. Um, some some are avid readers. Some learn by trial and error. Um, I'm much more of a trial and error than I am a, a, a strong reader. Um, but volunteering within your organizations to to be on cross-functional teams to help others out. Where's, you, you get to wear different hats. Remember, the bigger company you're in, the more narrow position you have, especially starting out. The smaller company you're in, the broader role you have, the more hats you get to wear. Both are important. They both have roles. Uh, and generally, the bigger company you have, the more progression you have, and the smaller company, the less progression you have. But they balance sometimes because you get to wear different hats and have different experiences. OK, I think that's all I have. So thank you for listening. I'd uh, be happy to take a few questions if you have any. Yes? Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm an international business student. Um, but my family uh, owns a family business. Um, and so I'm just curious how it looks when, uh, when you have the non-family member president. Like, uh, what does that look like when you select someone? And you know, how does the family feel about that? Um, it worked out great in a lot of ways, because he was able to serve as a mentor for my brother-in-law and I that were the next kind of next generation. So generally, it worked out great. Um, uh, he, he was experienced. He knew what he, his role was. Um, he didn't have any equity in the company, and he was OK with that. He was paid very well. Um, but it set up uh, ver very well, and we, I learned a lot of, of essentially outside experience through all of his experience, uh, and I, I, I value that. He also had the uh, 100 support of my dad, which helped a lot, and that gave him the flexibility and the freedom to kind of do initiate the initiatives he thought was best for the company and, and the family. So it was a, it was a good experience for us. Did everyone go along with it? Like, at the, you know, the suggestion of the idea, was everyone on board, or was it kind of a process to get your siblings and, you know, whoever uh, on board with the idea? Um, yeah, there was pretty much consensus. There was pretty much consensus. Yep. Who else? Yes. Uh, my name is Mason. I'm a business major here as well. Uh, you spoke about politics a little bit, and I was just wondering, as a business, with the results of the previous election, are you guys more nervous, excited, or neutral for the future of your business? Um, probably all three. <laughs> um, I'd be excited on the regulatory, if there's any regulatory relief from our, our standpoint. And it's really not, it's not that we don't want to make safe food, it's that, it's that um, you, want to have, you want to have common sense, and that's the most important part. Um, the the aspect of some of the threats and opportunities I think that needs to be monitored about whether some of the trade policies change that could have impact on manufacturing both import export I mean I think there's probably some gasping all over of of, of shake up there um, so it may impact manufacturing more than other sectors in our economy actually and it may be positive it might be negative because a lot of times you know it takes a long time to build a plant <laughs> right so what what is short term uh, policies, how does that impact short term operations? Right. I'm uh, sorry, third quote. Oh, do we? 
positive, negative, neutral. Yeah, that's about that's about it. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Tristan. I'm also a business administration student. Uh, mm -hmm. In most companies, there's pretty much a big, like one big turning point that most companies can attribute to their success. Where do you feel that that turning point was, and we're all on location? I would say there's probably a lot of sub ones, but there's prob there probably two major would be the, the leap of faith to buy the big facility that I, 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 sh I showed there. It's really, a, uh, the company doesn't really resemble before year 2000 at this point, based on our, our sales and our amount of staff that we have and the structure that we have. So it's almost, um, almost two companies. And of course, there's not a lot of people around before year 2000, except for uh, the old guys that remember that culture and the way that it was, it was then. So I'd say it's, it's different. Uh, sometimes you miss the old guard because it was life a little simpler then, um, but that was that was probably a big uh, turning point of investment and says, okay, hey, we want to be a world class manufacturing company. We want to be on the map. We weren't going to be on the map with a thirty thousand square foot factory in you know outside of York, Pennsylvania. We were going to be on the map with a world class uh, manufacturing facility where we can you know make products for for you know PepsiCo and, and Hershey's and Mars and those kind of uh, folks. So, yes. I'm also a business major, and I was just wondering what it's like working with some of the bigger camp, um, companies that use candy, like Hershey and Down and Mars, because you said you guys worked together, so I didn't know if there was a contract in place um, since you both produced candy. Uh, we're not really competitors. We're, we're, we're much more... Um uh, you know, there are there are prospective customers for various projects. So generally, we will work with R and D folks, and they have projects, they have ideas, they bring us ideas. Sometimes we can bring them ideas. Um, we're really selling capabilities more so than products. We're saying, hey, our equipment can make this range of goods, um, and what do you have in your brands? A lot of times they would attach, like the products you see here, they could attach their brands and sell a lot more, right? If you put planters on that um, peanut, peanut square item, or if you put Sunmade on that chocolate raisins item, you have a little bit more market cachet. So a lot of times they're attaching it from kind of that perspective. I'd say anecdotally from working with them, it's interesting because they come from a small company and they're from large companies. So a lot of times we have more experience because we're smaller and we wear a lot more hats on uh, dealing with kind of the bigger pictures of the business than a lot of times our contacts do because they're in charge of assigning us business and you know, I've been to Walmart. I've been to, to 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 sell those guys, and they haven't had that same opportunity. So it's 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 interesting. I, that's where I make the comment between big companies and small companies. It's really nice to be able to have um, both experiences. What's the average? Jo how many jobs does the average person have now? Six or something in the world? Six or seven. So it's nice to have that experience both ways, especially early on. Then you can decide, hey, I like this culture. I like this culture because they're very different. Anything else? Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Bobby Downey. I'm a marketing major, and I was just curious. You, you had mentioned before that a lot of manufacturing jobs are starting to go outside of the country for, for making food products. Is there an ongoing dis discussion within the corporation as to whether or not you guys want to join them and start manufacturing outside of the country? Well, I think it's it's something to watch for sure. I mean, it's on it's on the it's on the radar. That's why I brought that up. I mean, the the. Uh, that Hershey plant was wasn't built with a whole lot of fanfare on purpose, right? So, um, um, right now it's just something to be monitored from our, our standpoint. It's it kind of it's kind of difficult from a family perspective because uh, you know it's our, our 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 base and our home is in Pennsylvania, so um, it'd be a, it'd be a big a big task for us to take on. But something if we want to continue and the market goes that way, that we'll have to do. Some, some medium range companies have done it with a, a minimal range of success. Mo most notably in the hard candy business, there's almost no hard candy made in the United States anymore because of that sugar um, uh, uh, issue that exists here. Um, and hard candy is 98% sugar. So high sugar based products are generally made off, off, over, offshore for a long time now. Um, you one more question? Yes, yep. Uh, as a vice president uh, of sales and marketing, you're coming what, uh, which one of your personal qualities do you feel uh, helps you the most in your job? Patience, probably. Um, uh, patience and, and, and listening is extraordinarily important. Um, and communication. I mean, those are the, those are the, 
the keys as I'm growing as an executive too. Um, those are the biggest things to, to, to work on. We talk about that a lot with our leadership team of how do we better do that and make, you know, take the company to the next level. And a lot of it, when you're motivating people, is around those, those qualities. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We have, uh, everybody can take a sample, of at least one of each on the way out, like there's plenty for everybody. Um, thank you for your time today.